Hello, I'm Craig Constantine. I'm Tanya Del Rio. Good morning, Tanya. I guess it's just afternoon where you are. You're in Paris. Yes, it's. I'm envious. Three thirty. Mm, I'm envious. <laughs> Can't wait to get back to Paris. Um, I don't know that I'd say it's my favorite city, but it's definitely up there. Definitely a beautiful place to hang out, to visit. So many different neighborhoods. I'm off on a tangent. Before we started pressing record, um, we were chatting a little bit about you know calm, uh, how to be calm, what makes one not calm. Um, and I often say to people before we press record, podcasting, and then just like see what comes out. And you mentioned that it that for you, podcasting creates a space. And uh, I, a lot of people, myself included, talk about creating a space for the guest. But what you're doing with your podcast, and I think not to put words in your mouth, but the space that you mean is different from that. You're talking about creating a space for yourself or the podcast triggers a space for you. So I'm, I'm wondering, can you walk me through? So I, I know what you're doing, but when you get the postcard, what is it about knowing that you're supposed to record something? What is it about that, that creates the shift in your mind? Yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting process that I go through with these postcards. Like I am outside. Usually, it's a moment outdoors mm. that I'm I'm like a kind of researcher. <laughs> I go out with curiosity and I look for moments that are going to make me feel something. And I pay attention, so I'm, I bring the senses fully. Like I'm listening, I'm observing, I'm feeling like the temperature, the air, whatever it is. And then there's always a moment that I then capture and Mm. I write about it. And then the other part of it is like when I sit and record, and usually I take a picture too. So when I sit and record, I have an image in mind, I have the experience in mind, And then I write it and record it. And usually in all that process, I feel like fully present again in that moment. But also the ability to share it makes it makes the whole experience. It's like chewing on the good moment. Hmm. I'm eternally fascinated by the process of writing because I think I suck at it. So I, I really enjoy, like, I don't know, the, the obstacle is the way. I like to sit down and try and write and then go, man, that's bad. And I, I'm wondering, you, you just kind of like skipped right by and then I write about it and I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. How, how hard is it to, to take, how hard is it for you to take an experience and to try and write it down? Like that's a translation from you know, the, the visceral, the feeling, the, the temperature, the sun, the wind, how, how difficult it is, is it to go from that experience to go to something written and maybe as a corollary, like, has it gotten easier the more you do it or, or have you always been good at that? Or did you learn to do that somewhere else or? No, no, it, it just happened. I think it all started with the podcasting workshop when we had to do the 60 second exercise so I I was for for the listeners we we were supposed to record something in sixty seconds and share it with the group. So I started to go out and I was going for a run and then I would record whatever caught my attention without writing it most of the times. But then I realized once I I I, I did that for about thirty five days nonstop. So I mm. built the habit. So after that, that's how Postcards uh, from Paris was, like really how this project was born, was that once I had the habit, I, I put it into a podcast format. And then when I realized to convey something in 60 seconds, it has to be quick. So I started writing it to try to, because I, I, I have a lot of words always. <laughs> mm. So it's like, how do I convey that in a short amount of time? In theory, it was 60 seconds, but usually I try to limit myself 
to two minutes it, mm. that most postcards are under two minutes. So I think it's the building, the practice. Now, one almost one year later and 152 postcards later. Um, I'm clapping. <laughs> but it's it's building the muscle, right? And you were, you were asking yeah. how difficult or how not difficult. And it really is, it depends on when I write. Ooh. Like the morning, I have much more space for creativity than the afternoon. There's less chatter in my head. Mm. And then if I write, if I go outdoors and I write what I want to say right away, it usually flows much easier. Wow. So it, it, there's many things, many aspects. Some days it's super easy. Some days I'm I'm there and I it just doesn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slog. When you're writing, um, when you're out and writing, do you write uh, with pen and paper? Do you write like in a notebook? Like, do you actually run and then stop and then try and write, or is the is the journey to go out? and find an experience and write? Is that something you do specifically? Like, I'm going out the door to go do that. Like, tell me more about the actual process of how does one of those postcards, I'm air quoting, how does one of the postcards get created? Yeah, so usually and now it's more walking than running lately because I had any injury. But uh, so I go for a walk and I, I, I go to see the trees and the birds and listen mm. to the birds. So that's the, 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 it's not that I go to find something for postcards. I go to be outdoors and because that makes me feel really good. And I always just bring a lot of curiosity. And I think of it, as I said, like I'm bringing my senses for a walk. Mm. And it always happens that unexpected, on, I've been to this park so many times. And, or to the river. And every time I find something that captures my attention in a different way or that a moment that I'm like, this is the moment. Mm. <laughs> so it's when I come back home, I write directly in the computer and then I record. Mm. It's super interesting. I've I've taken enough walks around Paris to like, yeah, you could, you could totally do that every day for your entire life um, because the seasons change and the weather is different and there's just so many things going on. Um, do you have a preferred time of day that you tend to walk? Like, I, do you walk like early in the morning or late yeah. in the evening? Or? Ideally, if I'm out at eight is my favorite mm -hmm. time. Of course, now the weather will start to change, but the earlier, the better. Yeah, I, I, I feel because the park is a lot more calm. Mm. There's usually the runners and people walking their dogs, but not, not many more people. And, and Paris is calm. It's a city that you feel the calm in the morning. And as the day is going on, because I live close to the Eiffel Tower, Mm. It gets busier and busier as the. It's a different place, morning and evening. Yeah. So, and to me, again, because my mind goes fast, my nervous system needs the calm, <laughs> and it's like I need to stretch it. And postcards is a way that I found to to stretch that. Hmm. That's a great choice of words, stretch, and that that makes me think. Um, so I'm, I, I'm. A, I speak a tiny bit of French. No, we're not going there. But my question is, I definitely think in English, write in English, speak in English, like my thoughts are in English. Do you, um, when you're writing the postcards, do you do them? Uh, and I'll admit, I don't know if you put them out in English or French, but like the ultimate product is in which language? English. In English. And I'm, I'm originally from Mexico. So my first language is Spanish. Well, this is even better. <laughs> <laughs> what language do you think in? English, most of the time. Most of the time. And when you're doing the postcards, what are you thinking? In, English, totally. English. Like my vocabulary of gratitude and presence and all that is, you know, I did my yoga teacher training in English, my health coaching in English. Hmm. I coach mostly in English and I teach mostly in English, but I I also speak French and teach in French, hmm. but it's it's much harder. Hmm. Because I was going to ask, have you ever thought about or experimented with trying to do the same type of thing? Like, have you ever tried to create a postcard thinking in Spanish and recording in Spanish or thinking in French and recording in French? Have you ever tried that? No, 
I, I've never, but it's a good experiment. But I can add there that I noticed when I was interviewed for a podcast in Spanish, I could see that I was speaking and thinking a little slower. Like I, I was like finding the words in Spanish. Mm. And I, when I heard the recording, I'm like, oh, I was sort of the pace of it felt slower in a good way. Than... I was going to say better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in a good, it gave me that a little bit of space to th like think before answering in a quick way, but in the way, mm. it, the way it sounded, I felt like, oh, I, I didn't go in a tangent as easily. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always, I'm always fascinated by how language works, not just how you know, I make some noises ook, 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 and, you know, they come out on your side and then you have an idea like, why is he making monkey noises? Like, like you can communicate these ideas just by making sounds, which is a kind of magic, especially because we're on opposite sides of an ocean. Like, I just love, like, I love this century, but I've always, I've always wondered about are the types of ideas, um, I was going to say, can, are the types of ideas that one can have different, but I think it'd be better to say is it easier to have certain kinds of ideas in one language versus another? Um, or is it easier to have better ideas when you have to actually struggle with the language a little bit more? Like I find, like I said, my French is really bad, but from when I was trying to use it in France, I wound up being really economical with like, yeah, that's not worth saying. First of all, it's going to take me two minutes to figure out how to say it. And second of all, no, I'm just not going to say it. And I wound up like cultivating this much more mindful way of communicating. So I'm always fascinated by how language affects, you know, the way I think and what I think. And I don't know if you've ever, you know, since you have three languages at your disposal, if you have any more thoughts about that. Yeah, I think it, it is interesting. I When I started teaching yoga in French, I found it really complex because when I teach yoga in English, like it sort of flows, like I can make quick decisions depending on what the students need, especially in group classes. And that was a challenge when I was teaching. I started teaching in French because I had to go through so many <laughs> different steps to convey what, what I had to say. But as, as with everything, it's, it's practice, right? Like it's, uh, it's, it's really building that muscle. And, you know, I, at many points I was thinking I'll, I'll just teach in English because it's much easier than trying to make the effort to teach in French. But mm. because I, I kept going and just being patient with myself and having students that were <laughs> very patient with me, I opened doors and I met people and I, I have had an experience that I would have that would, wouldn't exist if I didn't push through in that mm. uh, in being persistent. But I, I don't know. I think it's, it's, I always encourage people, especially when they move here for a short time, I, I always encourage them to try, try to learn and make the effort because it's so worth it. Just even if it's the basics, it just opens doors to a culture in a new way. Oh yeah, I absolutely agree. Like just being able to, my reading comprehension is vastly better um, than my listening. And then my listening is better than my speaking. Um, and yeah, if you can at least read and understand this, like, cause everybody else, most people speak English, but they're not going to take the time. They're, they're not going to try and communicate the, um, museum display to you. And, you know, they're, they're like, yeah, it's a painting. <laughs> That's just like, yeah, there, I don't feel like I'm packing it for you in English. Um, but if you are able to begin to like dip in the pool in whatever the native language is, things, things always go better. And a lot of people I have heard say, oh, if you just learn the language, everybody's nice to you. That's not true. <laughs> I have met people who didn't care at all that I was trying to speak their language. They wanted me to just get out. I have had that happen in multiple places. Um, but most people who are generally nice will fall over themselves if you if you make the effort. So anyway, I'm yeah. off on a tangent. I, w I wanted to ask a different question, but now I forgot what it was. Um, Yeah, but it's, I, I think it's, a, I think this communication, and I, I think the, you know, going back to postcards at the end, um, I, 
I think it has allowed me to, like, I, I think the biggest gift it has been that it has allowed me to see Paris in a new way because I'm mm. so fully present. And I, I discovered, you know, I think the training the ears has been a gift because I, I'm, I arrive to the park and I know where the birds are. And depending on how it sounds, I know if they're high or low and I am able to find them quicker. And mm. now I, I share that with people, not only expats, but locals too, like my yoga students have, um, like there's, there's a new way of communication that it's just Paris and us. It doesn't mm. matter the, where are you from? And in mindful walks that I lead, I think that's a really cool thing as well, that everyone, it doesn't matter where you're from and what language do you speak, we can all be there fully present to experience what Paris has to offer. That's a terrific observation. I, I think I was going to ask before about, and then I forgot, and now I'm like, wow, you just answered the question I was thinking of, which is how... Is it different when you go out like um, looking for the spark that's going to lead me to today's postcard episode? And and you were like, you were just saying, I, I'm wondering if you've ever thought about your, so your ultimate thing that you're creating is audio, making a podcast episode. Um, have you thought about, so there's different types of experiences, right? You know, there's uh, I don't know if you're a croissant lover, but like, you know, there's the smell of the boulangerie, you know, in the morning, right? Which is totally a thing. Absolutely a thing. Um, have you been to the Rose Bakery on the north side? Oh, no. Go to, the, go to the Rose Rose Bakery. <laughs> Sorry. I, my wife has a beautiful book about it. Um, and we were in Paris and, and we literally stumbled on the bakery. Like the, it has places where they sell their stuff, but we just like, I'm walking up a street and I'm like, Hey, isn't that, you know, so like the things you fall over in a big city, sorry. What I was going to ask was when you go out in the city, there's the visual experience, there's the auditory experience, there's the aromas, there's, um, depending on what languages you language or languages you're in, you get different experience. So if you stand, uh, beside, you know, the, the whatever, stand somewhere where it's real busy, you might hear English if you're an English yeah. speaker versus hearing French. And, and these people are having different conversations. Maybe all the English speakers are tourists and all the French people are the local, whatever. Um, so there's the difference in experience you would get based on what language you're primarily operating in. So I'm wondering, you're, you're creating an auditory experience. You're creating a podcast episode. Have you ever wondered or looked into which of those mediums of experience leads to better episodes? If that makes oh, that's, sense. That's that's a really interesting <laughs> question. No, I haven't I haven't explored that. Um, but it's it's something worth thinking about. I think for me, I, postcards is mostly about you know urban nature or these moments outdoors or when I'm on my yoga mat and uh, I try to like sounds like if I'm near the church, I collect the sound of the church. But I. I I think it's it's worth thinking about it more for for the future as well. But um, yeah, I think I through the work I do in in all different areas, I just try to invite people to see Paris beyond the busyness or beyond mm -hmm. you know the, what Paris has to offer that it can be easily overlooked. As in any big city, like it's it's you get so carried away by all the, the everything that it's happening at once that um, sometimes we miss some some things that can be really nourishing for many of us. I agree one hundred percent. One of the th I was going to say one of the magical ingredients. I don't know that it's magic, but one of the really important ingredients about Paris is the city is lower. So you don't get lost in canyons. Like if you go to a huge, uh, huge meaning tall, like a tall city, like New York city, that you're in a street and, and that's all there is, is this one street. There's nothing else. Like you're not going to see things from two streets over. Um, and in Paris, uh, you know, five, six floors at most, 
So at a big intersection, you can see down the street, you can see the next thing over, you can sit in a square and, and look up and, you know, 45 degrees on either side is sky. Like there's, there's open yes. space above you. Um, I'm, I'm dancing. <laughs> I do have a favorite, although I can't remember the name. <laughs> I have a, rid- a ridiculously favorite cafe in a square, but the name escapes me at the moment. But the that's one thing that contributes to when you go out in a city like that. And there are other cities around the world that are like that. When you go out in a city like that, it's easier, I think, to experience the city, but to also not feel like the city is overwhelming you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think the sky, the sky, it's it's incredible. When we are when we moved to Paris 13 years ago, we arrived July 1st, and the first thing we we thought about was the clouds. The mm. summer clouds are like white, big, fluffy, and it, like that. You, if you see, if you pay attention to the sky, and now that we're transitioning to autumn, like the sunrises and sunsets are, you know, this pink in the air. Mm. It's it. You're just like I don't know, uh, it's in the sense of awe. I talk a lot about in in postcards because if you pay attention and you really look outside or you pay attention to the outside when you're walking, it's like you can be just like a, there's a sense of connection to the city uh, mm. that that is always there, but it, again sometimes it's easy to miss. Well, Tanya, I think. That's a terrific place to stop, I always say. Huh? And I'll hold the rest of my curiosity for another call. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for taking the time. And it's a pleasure, as always, to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this time. And, and I really appreciate it.